When we have a state space description of a linear system, state feedback is generally the most effective way to design a controller. Given a generic state space representation of a plant, x dot equals ax plus bu, uh, our control law is very simple. We multiply the state of the system by a gain matrix k to get the input to the controller. This gives us a new combined system with dynamics x dot equals a minus bk times x, or as I will use for the majority of this video, x dot equals a bar times x. By choosing k, we can modify the dynamics of this system to get the behavior we want. If we only want our system to be stable, then any k which makes a bar a stability matrix, or in other words makes the real parts of the eigenvalues of a bar negative, will work. In practice, we usually want more nuanced control over the system. Generally speaking, there are two methods uh, used to find a gain matrix k, pole placement and LQR. Pole placement works by taking a specific set of eigenvalues and finding k that gives a bar these eigenvalues. One way to do this is to use a similarity transform to put the system in a form where it's very easy to see how k affects the eigenvalues, then transform k back to the actual system. More advanced algorithms try to ensure the resulting eigenvalues of a bar are as robust to error in the system uh, as possible. LQR does not work on eigenvalues directly, but instead minimizes a specific quadratic cost function of the states and inputs. We pick gain matrices Q and R and N that specify how quickly we want our states to be controlled and how expensive control output will be. Then we solve the algebraic Riccati equation and use it to find an optimal gain matrix K. While both these, both these methods make finding stable controllers easy, there is more we can do with state feedback control. Beyond looking only at the stability of a system or at how quickly it decays, in many instances we care about the shape of the system response uh, and how different states are coupled together. For example, consider a double mass spring damper system, which we'll use as an example throughout this video. There are two masses attached to each other by springs and dampers with two independent force inputs. The state is uh, x equals z1, z2, z1 dot, and z2 dot. We might want to design a controller which decouples the dynamics of the two masses, making them behave as if they were not attached. Uh, you can see in the uncontrolled uh, system here, uh, coupling terms that mean that one mass, the position of one mass will affect the position of another mass. A more complicated example would be the flight dynamics of a plane. Most planes exhibit a coupling between states and their dynamics that can lead to some unexpected or difficult to pilot behavior. Increasing airspeed would increase uh, the altitude, for example. This property of systems can be understood and exploited uh, by eigenstructure analysis. The unforced solution of a linear system is the matrix exponential of the A matrix multiplied by the initial conditions. And for a controlled response of a state feedback system, uh, it would be the exponential of an A bar matrix. This exponential can be written using the eigenvector decomposition as V times the exponential of the eigenvalues times V inverse times the uh, initial conditions. Another way to write this would be as a summation. Uh, sum from i equals 1 to n of vi times the ith eigenvalue, the exponential of the ith eigenvalue, times a weighting, which here is determined by uh, the ith row of the inverse of the eigenvector matrix times the initial conditions. We can see that the response of the system here is just a weighted sum of the eigenvectors of the system uh, times the exponential of their corresponding eigenvalue. This weighting uh, can be thought of uh, as re-expressing the initial conditions using the eigenvectors as a basis. So our response is see, in our response we see how the various parts of the initial condition excite different modes of the system and how those modes evolve over time. Uh, with a system with coupled states, the eigenvectors uh, will show uh, non-zero values in, in all of the coupled states. So for example, for the double mass system that we have here, we can see non-zero values for the Z1 and Z2 states in the system. This means that an initial condition that excites Z1 will also cause movement in, the, in Z2, uh, which corresponds physically to the springs and the dampers pulling back and forth between the masses. When we use pole placement, we have no control over the eigenvectors of the system. While it's common to think of assigning specific poles to specific states, for example, I might want one of the masses to decay more quickly than the other, and so I pick a very negative eigenvalue for one and a less negative eigenvalue for the other. In reality, we have no way to specify which states these poles are applying to, and in practice, they almost always apply to a mixture of the states. This can make getting precise output behavior difficult, especially when we have rise time requirements for specific components of the system. 
Uh, LQR offers more control over how states will behave relative to each other. However, in LQR, we do not have any way to specify the eigenvalues, and thus we can't specify any specific damping characteristics. Eigenstructure assignment uh, is a method uh, that will let us uh, more specifically tailor our response. To see how this works, we're going to consider a hypothetical method for doing pole placement. Let's say we have a set of desired eigenvalues, and we're going to pick a gain matrix K for them. We don't know k yet, and we don't know the eigenvectors of the final system yet, but we do know that when we multiply a bar and uh, the ith eigenvector, we should get uh, the ith eigenvalue times that eigenvector, which means that uh, ei times vi minus a minus bk times vi equals zero. Uh, rearranging this into the following form, uh, we can express this as a matrix, uh, which would look like this. Uh, in this matrix, we are multiplying um, we're, we're just expressing the fact that the controlled system, when it's multiplied by a given eigenvector, uh, should, uh, should scale that eigenvector by the eigenvalue. And we've broken up uh, that eigenvector into two terms, the eigenvector itself and then k times the eigenvector. If we repeat this for every eigenvalue in our system, we get the following combined matrix, M, uh, which is a uh, n squared by n squared plus mn matrix and this uh, this uh, when we would solve for m uh, any solution to this equation will give us this vector of the eigenvectors of the system uh, and k times the eigenvectors of the system we can solve if we if we can find this vector we can solve for the gain matrix k by rearranging uh, k times the eigenvectors of the system into this matrix w uh, which is the same as k times v, and then taking the inverse of v on the right side uh, to recover our gain matrix k. This means that any solution uh, of this equation here uh, will give us a desired eigenvalues, will give us a gain matrix that, that will result in the desired eigenvalues. This uh, matrix M is an under-constrained uh, system. As we said, it's an n squared by uh, nm uh, sorry, n squared by n squared plus mn sized matrix. Um, so there are infinite solutions to it. In theory, any of those solutions could give us a valid gain matrix, but in practice, there are some issues with most of those solutions. Uh, most of them will result in a complex valued gain matrix, uh, and many of them will be poorly conditioned and difficult to solve for. However, uh, another way to look at this is that we can add further degrees of freedom or further constraints to this system to make it fully defined. Uh, and these further constraints can help us control the eigenstructure of the system. Specifically speaking, there are n times m extra rows that we can add before we have a fully defined uh, uh, system of equations. So let's define another set of equations for every eigenvector. Uh, we're going to pick a matrix Q, uh, which is going to be an m by n matrix, which is going to specify which components of the eigenvector we want to match um, which components of our of our achieved eigenvector we want to match uh, components of a desired eigenvector. Um, then we can rewrite our equations uh, as follows, inserting these extra rows uh, with the Q's in it and changing uh, the right side of our equation as well to reflect these desired, uh, you know, Q, these, these Q's times our desired eigenvectors. Our system is now fully constrained, and we can solve for a gain matrix K that additionally puts some constraints on the final eigenstructure. Uh, now all you need to do to solve for the final thing is invert the M matrix, solve for this uh, vector of uh, eigenvectors and K times eigenvectors, separate them out as we did before, and solve for the gain matrix K. Uh, the two problems with picking eigenvectors, however, um, is that they are usually complex valued and they have to correspond to physically sensical systems. So because the eigenvectors are complex valued and it's very hard to intuit what the what a complex valued eigenvector should be, uh, that can make sensibly picking them very hard. And as I said, they have to correspond to some physically meaningful system. So you can't have eigenvectors, for example, that separate the velocity and position terms for a given mass in a double mass spring damper system. It, it's not physically possible. Um, so the final part of this video, I'm going to demonstrate a method for picking eigenvectors based on a desired A matrix, uh, which will help us escape some of these difficulties with picking the eigenvectors.
if we look at a state space representation of a system uh, and imagine a form that we'd like it to be in but that is still physically realizable uh, then we can use that state space matrix uh, to find our eigenvectors so for example in this double mass spring damper system we pick an a matrix which has decoupled the states and which has the desired dynamics for each individual mass then we can use the eigenvector decomposition to break this matrix apart into the desired eigenvalues and the desired eigenvectors then we can use our uh, our method is above uh, to solve for uh, a gay matrix K. Um, picking Q can still be difficult uh, because the wrong choice of Q will not properly constrain our eigenvectors. So for a problem like this where we're trying to make sure that we're separating uh, the states and decoupling them, the Q matrix should be picked to make sure that each eigenvector uh, has a constraint on some part of it that isn't for the for the z1 mass and some part for the z2 mass. Uh, putting both of these constraints in makes sure that the eigenvector uh, cannot have um, non-zero values for both. Uh, these results, uh, finally we're going to look at some results really quick that demonstrate um, the effectiveness of the controllers. So these results that we can see here uh, show that for an eigen for a pole, regular pole placement uh, controller, uh, we have no way to stop the second mass from moving when the first mass is excited. Uh, but for an eigen structure controller, um, we have uh, proper uh, decoupling of the states. Uh, so the red red lines here are the eigen structure controller. You can see that there is no movement of the of the second mass when the first mass is uh, displaced. Um, I've also included in green uh, an LQR controller which has been tuned to have similar eigenvalues but which you can see still has the coupling of the states and there is no simple or, or you know, reasonable way to tune LQR controllers uh, to avoid this sort of thing. So eigenstructure assignment is the only controller that can easily give us this sort of state-by-state uh, -state control over the output.